All right, what awesome worship we had. We've got some of our LifeGate um, people out today. I know where most of them are. I think some people have just decided to stay home and enjoy the sunshine. So either it's raining and they don't come or it's sunny and they don't come. <laughs> but anyway, we love you in Jesus. <laughs> Miss you when you're not here. But boy, what a great looking group you guys are. Y'all make up for all the others that aren't here. All right. I got excited during worship. I mean, it was such a, wow, what a reverent time. I was reminded of a dream that I had several years ago where the Lord um, actually gave me a dream where I was uh, equipping, basically, the body of Christ. I was getting everybody dressed to dance with the king. That was my, that was my job. That was my assignment from the Lord. And uh, all these believers... Uh, were at Westminster Abbey of all places, but I was preparing the body of Christ to dance with the king. And I was, Barbara Yoder was one of them. I don't know if you know Barbara Yoder, but she's a friend of mine. And I was helping her get dressed, and I took her up front to meet the king, and I saw Jesus come out uh, into the room. And it was the most, I mean, I'll never forget the stream because it was so profound. He came out, he looked like I would picture Jesus to look, but he evolved uh, from just his face into a lion and then to, uh, to a lamb. And all this time he was evolving into all these things that he says he is and different uh, manifestations of, of who he says he is in the Bible and the, sim the symbols that he represents in the Bible. He evolved into all these names and as he was dancing, and then he would just leave one person and go to the next. I did not get to see myself dance with him, so I just danced today with him. I just took the liberty of just having fun, so got all y'all prepared to do it, so it was my time this morning. And I thought about the, the we, this is going to be a serious message. I've taught this message several years ago, but I felt the Lord say, teach it again. I'm going to be speaking on developing supernatural courage i've taught on it like i said before but this is a message that deserves to be repeated um, and it you know faith comes by what hearing and hearing and hearing and as i was just worshiping i just felt like laughing at the same time this joy just came over me at the same time and every now and then we do need to laugh and I had forgotten, it's, it's been, in my life personally, we've had so much going on with the building, and then I'm preparing to go to South Korea, trying to get my faith up there, uh, get my faith activa activated. Uh, you know, just the plane trip alone takes faith. The fact that you're, okay, get this. I mean, you have to have faith to get in an airplane. You, you know, we do it. We get on an airplane and we do it. But, uh, we really, uh, I'm not used to, I was terrified to get on airplanes. Uh, my father was afraid of flying, so I grew up afraid of flying, but I got over it. But just think about what you go through. You, you put your whole life at risk to get to, to board a, a, a tunnel of, of, of tin, <laughs> a tunnel of steel, a tube. Thank you, a tube. A tube of steel. And, and when you're in the air, it feels like plastic when you're landing, literally. The, you're shaking, and you wonder what this thing is really made out of. But the, the, um, the flight attendants, I mean, the flight attendants are preparing you for your final destination. <laughs> they say, we're about to land at your final destination. And then you end up at a place called a terminal. You will enter Terminal B, like it's your terminal flight. So I thought about, you know, what kind of faith you have to have to get, especially on the other side of the world, which is a 15-hour flight, and end up at a terminal, Dahlia. So they're going to send us off with faith today, laying hands on us. But while we're laughing, I just want to give you another, this is a joke. This is, this is really a joke. <laughs> I 
But it was funny when somebody else told it. Let me see if I can do it. Um, all right, this, uh, this email, I got this email, and it said, I woke up last night where someone was breaking into my house, and they were looking for money. And then it said, and so what did you do? And he said, I got up and looked with them. <laughs> and that's the joke I thought of when I had all this laughter come into my spirit. So I thought I'd share it with you. We could all get up and look for some money. But let's not wait until a thief comes in. All right. All right. Moving on with the scripture. Developing supernatural courage. See if I can get you back. All right. <laughs> All right. I actually told it, and I told it right. That's a miracle. I told, I told the joke right. You remember this? Because <laughs> I usually don't do that. Usually when I say I have a joke, Pastor Minky's eyes roll to the back of his head. <laughs> Because I usually get all the way through and I forget the end, <laughs> which, is, which is the funny part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, this particular passage is, I don't, we, we did not, we are not going to have this on the screen, but it's in Daniel 11, verse 32, and it's 32b, the end of Daniel eleven thirty-two. 32. It says, those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Those who know their God. Do, do we know God? We know God. We know God. And so this means that we are called to not just be strong, but to do exploits. All right. So we're going to talk about someone in the Bible um, that did great exploits. Uh, two people. A few weeks ago, I, do you remember the message on Shamgar? Those of you that were here, I taught a message on Shamgar. It's, and the passage was in Judges uh, 3, verse 31. Let's see if we can go there. All right. And this was the passage. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he delivered, also delivered Israel. So I taught a whole message on Shamgar, who slew by himself 600 Philistines with an ox goad. That's all he had was a stick with a sharp point on the end of it. And he was a farmer. And he used what he had. He used what, what he had available to him. He didn't wait for great big open doors. He didn't wait for a big promotion. He didn't wait till he was recognized. He didn't wait for a leg up or someone famous to help him. He just saw a need. He saw his family was in need. He saw that the nation of Israel had a need to win this battle against this enemy. And he took action. So... He did great exploits. When you say 600 people he slew by himself. And all he had was an ox goat. Today we're going to talk about someone named ben Ayah in the Bible. And his story is buried in the Old Testament of 2 Samuel chapter 23 and the 20 and 21st verses. And it really is the most inspirational story I think I've ever read or ever heard taught, and it's a passage that I doubt you ever heard in a Sunday school message before. Um, it's not a very well-known memory verse, and it wasn't taught at all in any of my theological classes. It has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on biblical doctrine, so there's not a doctrine built around it. In fact, if you read your Bible every year all the way through, it probably didn't show up on your radar as you read through it. But today, I think you're going to remember this story forever and probably you'll highlight it in your Bible. So let's look at it. Let's look at this passage. It says, starting in verse 20, ben the son of Jehida, uh, was a valiant fighter from Kebzeel who performed great exploits. 
He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in great honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. All right, so let's, let's unpack this. It's easy to read through a passage like this and really completely miss the most monumental act of courage displayed I have ever read. Have you ever met anyone that actually chased a lion? Now, we read all this about all the men he killed, about how he slew an Egyptian. All he had was a club, and this Egyptian had a spear. He got the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own weapon. And we read, you know, where he killed two of Moab's army. But what about this lion? Who in their right mind chases a lion? We could have gone several years ago to Barnum and Bailey Circus. Now, now that's not available to us anymore, unfortunately. But they have lion tamers. But you don't see a lion chaser. And Benaya was not on a safari with a gun in a Land Rover <laughs> looking for a lion, a lion well equipped with a hunting rifle. We don't even know what this man was doing that day or where he was going before his lion encounter. We don't know his frame of mind. The time of day, all we get from this passage is that this man had a gut reaction to chase down a lion. It would make more logical sense to run away from a lion rather than try to chase it down. Normal people don't chase lions. Normal people usually run from lions. It's not natural to chase a lion, but supernatural people do. Benaya saw a lion and seized the opportunity to chase it down. Well, let's talk a little bit about lions. Let me give you some lion lessons. They can run up to 35 miles an hour and leap 30 feet in a single bound. They can weigh up to 500 pounds. I like to picture it like this. This lion is running, and probably the lion makes this very crucial mishap. It gives way to ground beneath it. This 500-pound leaps onto a piece of ground, and the ground gives way to 500 pounds, a 500-pound frame, and he falls down a steep embankment. And this lion ends up in a snow-laden pit. It's full of snow. I'm sure the lion landed on his feet because cats do. They can fall, but they always land on their feet. Benaya is chasing him, but he gets to the edge of the pit, and he looks down into darkness. But he hears the roar of this lion, and he jumps in after him. Remember, he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day. Jumps in after the lion while he's roaring. Now, if I were a betting person, I would have bet that the lion would have won the battle. But Benaya wins. They fight it out, and he wins. So let's back up a little bit again and really think about this. Normal people don't chase after lions. But this man did. He saw it as an opportunity 
for something. What was his gut reaction? I'm going to chase that lion down. But why? Why would anybody in their right mind do that? Someone like this seizes an opportunity for greatness when it comes along. I don't think Benaya actually asked to face this challenge, but maybe he was thinking that lion killing event could be a part of his resume one day. After all, David chose him to be his bodyguard. An opportunity like this set him up with an appointment with the king of Israel for a job opportunity. We never know what an opportunity can bring our way. We don't understand what looks like a, maybe a bad moment. Think about this. It started off maybe as a bad day for this man. A lion runs in front of him. It could have been a bad, a super bad day. I would have thought something like that could qualify as a really bad day if a lion comes across my path. And then I would be chasing it thinking, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But can you see how God took a bad break and made it into a breakthrough? And how we have so many opportunities that come our way that look impossible. And we run the opposite direction rather than chase down the impossibility. And seize a moment that God can use for his glory. Here's the point. God is in the resume building business. Interesting, the name Benaya means to build. As God, Jehovah builds. God was building this man. All he had done before was slay two Moabites and an Egyptian. And now he's promoted to greatness because he chased a lion. God wants to build your resume. God is always using a past experience to prepare us for a future opportunity. I think many of us could look over probably the last several months, the last few weeks, and examine what we've been through. And actually, I know for me, myself, I've wanted to run the opposite direction. Sometimes you get under so much stress, you don't, you don't see the opportunity so that you can seize it for something better. Because we're focused on the problem rather than how big our God is in the midst of it. How we react when we encounter these opportunities <laughs> will determine our destiny. Our, many of our God-given opportunities can be distinguished as a man-eating lion. It's that challenging. How are we looking at our storms? Are we in the boat, and Jesus has already said, I mean, he's already done this incredible miracle on land, feeding the 5,000, all these thousands he's fed with just a small amount to work with. And then he tells the disciples, get in the boat, go to the other side, I'll meet you over there. And then they get in the boat and a storm comes up. And God wants to use that as an opportunity for all of them to walk on water. <laughs> Not just one. And every storm that we face is an opportunity to walk on water with God. 
It's not about us. It's about him getting the glory. We can't do that on our own. It takes faith. But those who know their God are strong and will do exploits. If we think we're going to do things like that on our own, we are going to fail. We are going to fear. But when we know our God, we know that if he tells us to meet him on the other side, he plans to get us there. Regardless of what type of storm heads our way or what size lion passes by. There's always been a part of me that likes playing it safe. I have to work on the other part a lot. I'm sure some of you can relate. No one likes a storm. Nobody really likes a challenge. It's not something we ask for. And yet it is, at the, it is the problems in our life that bring the most growth. It's what keeps us humble, but it's also what forces us to dig in to know God in a greater capacity and to trust him evermore. And we will not gain spiritual strength by not having issues that we have to press through. You don't build muscles in the natural unless you lift weights or get some type of exercise. And I don't know of that many people that really love to jog or work out. We do it because we say we like it, but we do we really love it? I mean, I go to the gym because I have to. When you start getting older, you need to lubricate a little more your muscles. Everything gets stiff the older you get, so you work out so that you can keep active, so you can live longer. But I don't like it. I, and we, every time we go to the gym, we pull up at the front of the gym, and we look at each other, and we go, and, do we have to get out and do this again? And we get out, we go, and, then we're, and we're so glad it's over, and we go back and fall in the car. And then Pastor Mickey drives us home, and we think, well, we made a sh we'll wait till another 24 hours. We do this again. It's not something we look forward to, but it's something that we face and we challenge ourselves to do something because it's good for us. So let me just encourage you today. It's good for you to chase a lion. When a problem comes by, and they do face it head on because we are strong in the Lord. You know, life is all about taking risks, isn't it? And facing all types of uncertainties. We don't like uncertainties. I, I'm a certainty person. I like to know. I like to know what's coming. I like to know what package is going to come in. I want to know what day it's going to arrive. And then when I order something on Amazon, I want the tracking number. And if it's not there on the day that it says it's supposed to be there, I am online filing my complaint with Amazon. <laughs> and when I do same-day delivery, by golly, it ought to be there same day. And when it's not there, that's my lion. I'm on it. I'm chasing that package down. But they ought to not offer it if it, they can't do it. I mean, it's, I don't care if it is free delivery. I don't know how many of you also have had sleepless nights with fear in your heart. Like, how am I going to get through that? 
what am I going to do when I get there? Uh, like, I have to go to South Korea and teach six messages, you know, right? And I have to come up with six new messages to teach. And I'm like all over the place asking God to give me all these things I'm going to need. And I get, get it in my head. Like, oh, my gosh, when I get there and then I start going here, there in my head. And then I'm exhausted before I even get on the plane. I've already worked myself out, <laughs> preached all those messages before I even leave home. <laughs> Worried about it. Did anybody else relate? Okay, you don't have to show me your hands. But I have had sleepless nights because of fear. Fear of failure. Fear of, God, are you going to show up or not? And you know what? It boils down to this. Because I'll get there, and this happens every time. I'll get there, and it'll be great. Because you know why? Because God is faithful. It's not me. It's not me anyway. I'm just the vessel. I'm just obedient. I'm trusting him to, to put the words in my mouth, to speak it. And then you've got translation on top of that. So by the time they translate it, I've already forgotten what I was supposed to say next. <laughs> and so I started thinking about that last night, like, oh, my gosh. I remember how it was last time. I just had to stay on the edge waiting for him to finish so I could, uh, and John, baby, you know, like, will you finish so I can finish mine? And so I'll start worrying about all of it. And then I finally concluded, well, I made it through last time. It came out okay. It was a challenge. I was always interrupting the interpreter. But I finally settled down, you know, and trusted the Lord. <laughs> Dolly, you just wait. You're going to be there this next time. <laughs> All the uncertainties that we are faced with. What if that money doesn't come in that I need for my house payment? Oh, my gosh, I've got to send my child to, to daycare, and I'm short this month. What, what hap what's going to happen? And we go all the way through this in our head. Oh, I'll have to tell. I'll have to go to the supervisor. I'll have to tell them I don't have the money, and then they're going to kick little Johnny out of school. And then I'm going to, oh, my gosh, and Johnny's going to cry all the way home. And then what am I going to tell Johnny when I get him home? And, I mean, here we go. And then we're on the phone calling Sister Lulu to please pray. Because, and and, and it, you still got three weeks left in the month <laughs> for the money to come in. Anybody else go through anything like that? But to be, when, when you get on the other side of it, and I'm, like, still looking in the rearview mirror of this. But I'll have to admit, the biggest risks that I have faced in life opened up the biggest opportunities. The, I mean, I can remember times when we uh, were in the home building business, and we would, we would take, we would have several houses going on at the same time, and we would go to the bank. I think one time we had two two different banks we were working out of, and we had over $2 million out in, uh, in construction that were all, none of them were pre-sold. They were all, you build it by faith, and Lord, please send us a buyer for this house. And, of course, nowadays that wouldn't hardly put up one or two houses the way the land is going for now, but I'm just saying, but if we hadn't have taken the risks we would have never been uh, as financially stable as we were at that time. But if, you're gonna, if you are going to make money, you're going to have to invest some money. And that takes faith. It, and if you want a house, you're going to have to have the faith to believe God to make the payments on the house. That's just the way it works. It's the way it works with God. But I'm telling you, God is setting the stage for every single one of you to have greater success. Don't settle for where you are now. There are greater things for you to do. There are great exploits still for us to accomplish. 
There's a doctor named Neil uh, Rose who wrote a book called If Only. And in the book, he, he distinguished two different types of regret. There are regrets of action and regrets of inaction. And uh, the regret of action is wishing you hadn't done something. You just wish you hadn't done it. Have you ever done something? You go home and say, man, I wish I hadn't said that. Or I wish I hadn't done that. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but the regret of inaction is wishing you had done something. Because, see, when an opportunity comes by, there's if you act upon an opportunity within 20 minutes, it has to be within 20 minutes, you'll have a greater level of success of accomplishing what you acted on. But if you wait 24 hours, there's like a 3% chance you'll do it. So when opportunity comes, you need to seize it. Don't what you, you can say, oh, I need to pray about that, but pray fast. <laughs> Sometimes we just need to get an unction real quick and know that that's it. Everything doesn't take a week to pray through. Even though I believe in that, don't get me wrong, you need a peace. But a lot of times I have to move quickly and... I don't know if I have a piece or not within a few minutes. Not always, but many times. But I've learned that when opportunities come, I need to move quickly if I really want to seize that. And it's always been an investment for us, but we've learned that if we're going to make an investment and we don't act on it quickly, chances are in 24 hours we'll talk ourselves out of it and we will have missed a great opportunity that God planned to bless us with. So just be praying about that, because I believe God's going to offer you some opportunities. So I believe the church has been fixated on the sin of commission far too long, which, which is the sin of doing something we wished we hadn't done. We, we get caught up on that, much more so than... The sin of not doing something what we should because of fear and the lack of faith. So let's be honest with ourselves today. Do we run from the problem? Have we been running from a problem? Or are we going to be determined to face it head on and defeat it? The way you defeat it is always going to be using your faith. And that's what empowers you to do great exploits. So we've, we've become far too passive. Lion chasers are very proactive. And lion chasers know that if you play it safe, it's risky. See, we think we'll play it safe because we don't want to take a risk. But if you're a lion chaser and you play it safe all the time, it's risky to you because you've got to always be proactive, thinking, chasing, jumping in the pit with the lion. Because winning the battle is what's important to a lion chaser. It's always courage. Bottom line, supernatural courage that stirs up that gift of faith. Winning the battle is important, but it takes courage to chase your dream. Boy, it's quiet in this little Presbyterian church this morning. <laughs> I wrote this down. Lion chasers don't allow their fears or doubts to keep them from doing what God has called them to do. Success is making the most of every opportunity. Spiritual maturity is seeing and seizing your God-ordained opportunity. And think of it like this. Every opportunity is God's gift for you. 
Think of every opportunity as God's gift to you. And what you do with those opportunities is your gift to God. What you do with your opportunity is your gift back to God. Ben Aya went on to have a very impressive military career. See, David looked over his resume, and all he could focus on was he chased a lion in a pit on a snowy day. That's the kind of man I want. He's going to be my bodyguard. He's going to be right next to me all the time. He's brave. That's the kind of guy you want standing next to you, right? This man climbed all the way up the chain of command to be the commander-in-chief of David's entire army. He may not have been one of the three <laughs> or the 30. He was the main guy. But it all started off with what could have been labeled as a really bad day. I mean, snow would just stop most of, most of us. Just snow shuts us down. A snurf, if we get a snow flurry, they close down the schools. But chasing a lion on a snowy day and then jumping in a snow pit with it, God is in the business of positioning, positioning all of us at the right time, at the right place, and what seems originally as the wrong place as, and the wrong time. But at every time is the right time with God. There's no wrong time if we're following the Lord. We're called to look for opportunities in every problem and obstacle and take risks to reach God's best for us. And I'm going to close with this. When we don't have the guts to step out and chase lions, then God is robbed of the glory that rightfully belongs to him. See, that's really bottom line what this is all about, is that he wants the glory, and this is how he gets it, by using us, knowing that we can't do it without him. And he loves that. He loves the fact that we can't do it without him, but he wants us to do it anyway. Because he expects us to know we can't do it, without him and believing that he's going to empower us to do it so that he ultimately gets all the glory. Wow. It's amazing. I'm sitting here looking at a whole room full of lion chasers. Every single one of you it doesn't matter what you've been going through, doesn't matter what challenge is in front of you. I mean, you may not be called to a pulpit ministry, but you've got a ministry right where you are. Day in, day out. Some of you may not be called to go to the nations. But for me, when I go to the nations, I fight all kinds of demons before I even get there. So, in one way, be glad you're not called to the nations. But on the other hand, God's going to get the glory when I get there because I know I can only do this through him. What about what you face every day? When you go to work, the challenges you face at work, the challenges you face with your children, Praying for your children. Does it ever stop? 
I don't think it ever stops, no matter how old they get. I've got a daughter. She's in her 40s. I pray just as much now for her as I did when she was a teenager. And she required a lot. <laughs> she really did. But now she's got other challenges that she faces. And you never stop being a mama. You never stop being a father. You're always going to be praying for your kids. And if you have a job or if you have a business, it's going to require faith. It's going to, especially if you own your own business because you believe in God to supply. You are the boss. You can't go to a boss on the job and expect a paycheck from him. You get your paycheck from this man upstairs directly. So we've all got, we've all got a lion to chase today, don't we? But I'm expecting, you see, we're going to start testimonies again. We need to start having some more testimonies. Because God is coming through for people, and, and we all need to, to know it. We need to know each other's successes. We're in this battle together, and we do better in battle when we battle together because we encourage one another in the Lord, right? So I want you to start sending us some emails, talking to us, tell us you have a testimony, tell us your testimony. We want to hear your testimonies. We're having incredible breakthroughs. People are getting healed, and uh, they're getting good reports from the doctors. And so, and people are getting better jobs and promotions. So, we want to share those things. Amen? But that's chasing a lion. All right? So, let's stand to our feet. Let's get a, let's get a, um, we're going to release, uh, we want to say goodbye to the internet family. So glad you joined us today. We'll see you again next week. Have a great week in the Lord. Amen. All right, let's, let's just believe God for a sh good shot in the arm. First Friday nights, I like to call them First Friday Night Encounters. Um, it's nights where we come and just do worship and also do ministry, and we just come and encounter God uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, worship, we just kind of hang loose and just go for it and just uh, give it everything we got. Um, Pastor Mickey, Pastor Sandy, uh, they always have some kind of trick up their sleeve when it comes to just wanting to minister to people, you know, because they're just letting the Holy Spirit lead, and they're like, oh, the Holy Spirit's saying this, and they go off and do that, and it's just really one of those times where we we let the Holy Spirit do what He wants to do uh, in those times. There's times where we've gone pretty much the entire time just do worship, and there's been times where we uh, were doing worship, and we'd pause, and we'd have ministry time, and then worship, and then pray for people to get healed and they get healed and go back to worship. So it's just a really, really good time in the presence of God. If you want to have an encounter with God, that's definitely the time. What time is first Friday service? What is the purpose of our offering free? Who is Mickey Freed? Who is Dr. Sandy Freed? How do I get involved? What do we teach our children? What denomination is LifeGate Church? What events do you have coming up? What is the fivefold ministry? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What do you teach the teenagers? How do I volunteer? Sometimes people have questions, but they may not be able to speak them. They may not feel like they are confident enough to ask those questions. And so this video, its purpose is to empower you to, to ask us 
Ask us what our offering decree means. What, ask us why we do the things that we do. Ask who is Pastor Mickey Freed and, and Dr. Uh, Sandy Freed. Ask those questions so that we can give you the answers that you need so we can provide clarity. Because LifeGate Church is not a church of confusion as our God, Jesus Christ, is not a God of confusion. And so that is the purpose of these videos. If you all have any questions or concerns, please use the hashtag AskLifeGateChurch for more information. Hey everyone, just a quick update on the building. The electrician has already been through, the drywall is going up in the sanctuary, and we're so excited to see this finally happening for us here at LifeGate Church. If you feel led to give to this ministry, the link is down below, and thank you so much for believing in LifeGate Church.